Praise God. You got to love the spirit up here. Charlie's testimony. Pay your tithes. Heal the boils. Any questions? <laughs> what an incredible conference. Can you say amen? And what an epic day today. Great preaching. Pastor Paul Stevens and that uh, altar service, that praise. There's hope for our generation. Can you say amen? I hope to just ride in the draft of all that God's doing tonight. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 15. Believe God together. Genesis chapter 15. I read a story out of the 1950s. There was a teacher that assigned his high school seniors to write a paper called My Goals in Life. And there was a student, his name was Monty Roberts. He had a dream. He wanted to own a thoroughbred horse racing facility. And so he wrote a paper with a detailed plan to achieve this. And the teacher returned his paper with a failing grade. And the teacher wrote on the paper, this is a wild, unattainable dream. I know your family and background. It would not be possible. Dejected, Monty shared the story with his mother, and she, upset, said, I don't think it's for a high school instructor to set a level on your hopes and dreams, and said, you have to make your own decision, and Monty returned his paper to the teacher with a note saying he believed in his plan and that the teacher shouldn't limit his aspirations. So the story goes that Monty Roberts accomplished his dream very, very powerfully, very successfully. And one day, having achieved his horse racing facility, he got a call from his former teacher. His teacher asked if he could bring a group of students to tour the stables. And as they were there, the teacher addressed the group of students and said, there was a time that I told Monty that this was unattainable. Now we've all had a good look at how he proved me wrong. And he said these words, my student has taught me the most valuable lesson I have ever learned. You know, in the kingdom of God, we have potential and destiny. And if we're going to reach that, we must contend for this. And I want to look at the father of our faith, Abraham, a sermon I've called Attitudes of Increase. Genesis 15, I'm going to skip through this. Let's start with verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. Let's go to verse 5. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought all these to him and cut them in two and down the middle and placed them each piece opposite the other. And he did not cut the bird in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away, down to verse 17. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. And on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. Attitudes of increase. Amen. I want to look, first of all, at profitable decisions. Now, the latest trend in the junk science field, how many of you know what the junk science field is? This is what the Apostle Paul referred to as oppositions of science, falsely so-called. This would be alongside of evolution and climate change and all the other nonsense that's passed off as science. But the latest trend, if you've uh, picked up on this, is the desperation to claim that somehow all behavior is inborn and chemically motivated and activated in the brain. Everything from OCD, you know, uh, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, to depression, to bipolar, 
ADHD, homos, transsexual, transgender. And it's just a matter of time. I just read an article in, in an Australian magazine from May of this year that said that pedophiles, and they're actually claiming that they were born this way. So this is the new trend, and you might as well get ready for this. The uh, very interesting that even the violent psychopaths, now they're arguing that somehow they were, uh, these are people that are just, uh, programmed to be this way. It was very interesting. Um, Dr. James Fallon is a man who has spent much of his career studying this new brain scan technology. And he was asked to look at some, uh, some brain scans. And what they had done is, without telling him, they had sewn into this pile of brain scans a number of serial killers and psychopaths that were in prison. And they asked him, just see if they, you know, he find any patterning in this and so he did and and he separated things into what he felt was a pattern and they found that the psychopaths had similarities in their brain scans and of course they said aha they were born this way and he was discussing this at a family reunion and his mother said well did you know James that your cousin is Lizzie Borden which is like a, an old famous axe murderer from back in the day and so he thought, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, let's test the whole family and see how we go. So he tested the whole family, and to his shock and surprise, they were all normal but his. <laughs> he happened to have the same brain pattern of the violent psychopaths. And you know all the family were going, mm-hmm. Explains everything. The truth is he wasn't a violent psychopath. And so it threw it into crisis. And of course they have to come up with another accommodating theology. But I want to tell you at the same time, neuroscience, proper neuroscience, is really revealing just the opposite. They're revealing that humans are not machines at the mercy of our brains, that we are free moral agents and our brains are made of neuroplastic, and our thoughts, listen to this, actually change the structure of our brains and our DNA. A quote from a book, Switch on Your Brain, which Chris Plummer has dubbed, dubbed the all-time hardest book to recommend to somebody. I read a book that I think will help you. It's called Switch on Your Brain. Anyway, the... The, book, the quote, listen to this, it says, Breakthrough neuroscientific research is confirming daily what we instinctively knew all along. What you are thinking every moment of the day becomes a physical reality in your brain and body. They call this neuroplasty. These thoughts collectively form your attitude, and it is your attitude, not your DNA, that determines the quality of your life. Scientifically, it is called epigenetics. Or in other words, the choices you make today not only impact your spirit, soul, and body, but impact the next four generations. And the comment that is made, once again, science is catching up with the Bible. In our text, we see Abraham. And we see clearly the very powerful, profitable decisions that he made that set in motion very powerful dynamics that remain to this day. In verse 1, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham. After what things? After a series of very powerful choices of faith and sacrifice that this man made. In verse 4, it says, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one shall come out of your own body shall be your heir. We see that he is he's being challenged to believe that he is going to have a, a son. And it's, it says in, in chapter 12, uh, we see some of these decisions. It says, now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your family from your... Get out of your country and from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. In verse 4, so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him, and Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So he, by faith, 
Hebrews says, he obeyed when he was called to go to a place which he would receive as an inheritance, uh, and he went not knowing where he was going. These are decisions in obedience to God. He decides he's going to, at the expense of comfort, at the expense of the predictable, at the expense of culture, he's going to step out and believe God. We see then, as the story progresses into chapter 14, that, uh, that Lot uh, uh, needs to be rescued. He, he does this, uh, and he tithes on the spoil, and there's an encounter in this chapter that's very profound in chapter 14, verse 21. The king of Sodom comes with an offer that must be refused. He says, give me the souls and take the goods to yourself. The king of Sodom was bargaining with him. Can I tell you something? Everybody in this tent has an appointment with the king of Sodom. And we know what's happening in our culture with the queer marriage and the, the, the homosexual march, and we associate that correctly to Sodom. But I want to tell you something. Isaiah says the sin of Sodom was pride, too much food, and too much leisure time. And you put those things in a culture, and it progresses to the hedonistic, foul, perverse sin that we are all uh, 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 powerfully averse to. But I want to tell you something. You can, you can uh, preach your sermons against gay marriage, but pastor, you have an appointment with the king of Sodom. And that spirit is going to come to you and try to make a deal with you. You keep the goods and leave the souls with me. These are the decisions of destiny. And Abraham said, I'm not doing it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take one shoelace from you. And he relied on God for his future. And you and I are the sum of our decisions. So verse four and five of our text, he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and it accounted unto him for righteousness. That is the spirit of what we're going to be doing tonight. That's the spirit of our fellowship. That's the set of decisions that has brought us to where we are. This is what drives world evangelism. Couples going by faith by the prompting of the Holy Spirit not willing to trade souls for comfort, every congregation that rises up and decides to believe God, if we're going to fulfill our destiny, first, the attitude of increase is linked to our choices. Secondly, I'm going to look at processing sacrifice. We've heard a lot about this truth this week, and for good reason, and that is how you file life's experiences is going to determine your future. It's not what happens to you, it's how you process it. And many people have a wrong view right here. Right here. They have the, a mistaken view when it comes to sacrifice, when it comes to the demands of the gospel and the word of God. The mistaken view begins as God's directives are unreasonable. This is where the devil tempted Adam and Eve and said, Surely you won't die. God knows the day that you eat of this fruit. Your eyes will be open, and God's holding out on you. And this is unreasonable, what he's asking of you. The children of Israel, they were, they were tempted and, and, and bought into the notion, God brought us out here to kill us. His demands are unreasonable. What he's asking of us is beyond what, what, what should be asked. In the New Testament, Jesus said, some of the seed fell among stones. It grew up and, and, and died quickly. And he said the explanation is their people, they get offended at trials. They get offended at persecution as if somehow this is a raw deal. Somehow what's being asked of me is not reasonable. The servant that was given one talent, what did he accuse the master of? And the master represents God. He says, I knew you were a hard man. I knew. I knew what you were like. And this is proof of what I felt about you. And this is, the, this is the, uh, the processing of life. Fascinating quote. I want you, to, I want you to, to, to write this down. 
Somebody said, all sacrifice is in reality a form of bargaining. That's going to help you. All sacrifice is in reality a form of bargaining. If there's anywhere that that's true, it's the kingdom of God. Jesus said, whoever shall seek to save his life will lose it. But whoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel shall find it. The call to sacrifice is a call to an upgrade. It is a trade. It is a form, you could call it, of negotiation or bargaining. It is something that we, by an act of faith, do, knowing that in the kingdom of God, God is no man's debtor. We're always trading up. Do you believe that tonight? There's a mistaken view, then, that the promises of God are somehow on autopilot. 1 Kings 18 and 1, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. That's a pretty straightforward promise. Hadn't rained for three years. God said to the prophet Elijah, go show yourself to Ahab, I will send rain. There it is. You do your part, I'm going to do my part. And so Elijah did his part. He went, confronted, and then what? He was not content to sit back and wait. This is a profound lesson. Believer, listen here. He could have easily said, look, I did it. God said, show yourself, I send rain, I'm going to go take a nap. I've done my part. But he did not do that. He went to Mount Carmel. He cast himself down. He put his head between his knees. And he prayed with great fervor. It says seven times he prayed and was sending the servant out to see if the rain had come. I believe it would have been 70 times if he had to. In other words, Elijah had a promise from God, but he was not content until he prayed that promise into his experience. Because the promises of God are not on autopilot. There's a lesson to be learned here. And that is that you and I need to be able to contend and we need to process the call of God to sacrifice and we need to steward that and protect that until the blessing of God becomes our experience. It's interesting in verse 8 when God makes him the promise he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? You know what fascinates me is that God did not take this as a, a symbol of unbelief. God makes a huge promise to this man. And I think culturally what Abraham was doing was more like very eager to take God up on the offer said, it's a deal, God, let's shake on it. Say, let's seal the deal here. Because I believe you, and I'm taking this very serious. Are you willing to put that in writing, Lord? Because I believe you. I want, I, want, I want evidence of this, because I know you're going to bring this to pass. Abraham was proving God. And Malachi gives us permission to do that in certain areas. Bring the tithes, prove me now. He's giving us permission that when we bring a sacrifice to God, Listen, tonight, I don't know all that's going to happen, but what's in the wind is that it's going to be big, amen. That we're going, to, we're going to do something tonight. And you know what that means? We're going to have to sacrifice. We're going to have to give. And the Bible gives us permission that when we bring our sacrifice, we can prove God. We can say, God, I am bringing this to you, and I am sacrificing, but I know that you're going to bring a blessing to my life. This is the spirit of what Abraham is doing here. He says, you can hold me to this. And again, you know, that's delightful. Charlie's testimony, pay your tithes, heal the boils, connect the dots. It's not rocket science. But you know, sometimes it doesn't work just like that. 
Thank God when it works like that. Thank God when you give and then bam, you know, the check's in the mail the next day or you give and then revival breaks out. But I want to tell you something. There's another part to this. There's another part to this. Verse 11, and when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. That means that there was a time frame here and there was a period where there was a contention that was brought against his sacrifice. And what's, what's interesting, the commentators say that everything that, that he was told to offer would, would, would mirror that was, which was offered in the temple. And, and here was something very powerful, very symbolic, uh, and very spiritual. And here comes the devil to destroy that. And Abraham drove the vultures away. Can I tell you something, pastor? Can I tell you something, disciple and believer? That you're going to have to fight for the blessing of God in your life. Because there's a time factor. We know there was a time factor between the first time Abraham got the promise for the son and the baby shower. Many years. There was a time factor between the laying out of this sacrifice and the meeting of God. And Abraham had no idea how long that was going to be. But he said, bless God. This is my sacrifice. Uh, the devil's not going to pollute this. Uh, I am not going to give this up. Uh, and it's, it, I've heard it said that after we tithe and after we pay our offering, what we have done is we've moved the battle to holy ground. But there's still a battle. It gives us home court advantage. It gives us the upper hand, as it were. But Elijah, casting himself down on Mount Carmel, praying until the blessing came, is a, is a great lesson to you and I. Abraham driving away the vultures. And it's very possible that people get diverted. You know, in chapter 16, Abraham grew impatient, made a critical mistake. And we know all about that the illegitimate child. And, but chapter 17, he remedied that mistake. Aren't you glad that the heroes of our faith are not so perfect that we could never hope to imitate them? See, Abraham made some mistakes, but he put that away. There's likely to be some people here tonight that you've, you've been diverted. Maybe because you've been waiting. Maybe because you've been discouraged. It didn't work out the way you wanted. Or it, it didn't happen in the time frame that perhaps there's some, some Hagar action going on. Spiritually speaking. <laughs> Religious diversions shortcuts and fads and can I tell you something God's promise is, is sure the inheritance of fruitfulness is our portion it is sure and it must be contended for the attitudes of increase we have to properly process sacrifice over time I want to close then with an exceeding great reward you know we heard from Pastor Elliot about Samuel Marsden in New Zealand what a powerful story here is a man who could have gone, it could have gone into history as being the flogging parson. A parson is a pastor, the flogging pastor. Instead, by choices and no doubt sacrifice and great risk, became the apostle to New Zealand. You know, when he, when he was preaching that, it was reminded me of the old illustration that some pastors, you know, would, would it, it would be fair of them to put a warning sign on their pulpit. The beatings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> and they become so frustrated and they become just so cynical that church becomes these, these sessions where it's the flogging pastor. And you know what? Thank God that this man woke up smart one day and said, I don't want it to go down like this. I don't want to spend the rest of my life flogging. I need, I need something bigger than this. And if that means I have to step out and take a risk, so be it. I'm going to change. I'm going to, I'm going to get bigger than this. 
See, the attitude of increase is convinced this does not have to be my final chapter. Verse 17. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. And on the same day, the Lord made a covenant. God met Abraham in the midst of his sacrifice. No sacrifice goes unnoticed by God. Listen, he is not unrighteous to forget your labor. He is not unrighteous. God will meet with you. It's a young man named Donovan Dez got saved when I was in Gallup in, in 2005. He was 16, 17-year-old, just a wiry little Navajo kid. And uh, backslid, came back into the church just before I left, 20 years old. But this time he had now a girlfriend in tow, and she was either pregnant or just had a baby. And he's thinking, i got to serve God. i got to repent. And got married, had their baby. And Old Donovan, well, young Donovan, <laughs> he was a bull rider. That's what he did for a living. He was pretty good at this. And he would often win. He would often win these, these bull riding events. But it's very dangerous. And he knew that if he was going to be a disciple and if he was going to do something for God and be a good husband and father, He's got to quit, man. He's got to hang up the spurs or whatever it is you have when you do that, you know? <laughs> so he did. He, by an act of faith, he says, I'm quitting, and he goes to work at Walmart. And I think what they did is they assigned him to the task of collecting the carts, you know, the guy with the big leash, you know, and, which is a lot like bull riding, but different. <laughs> and I'll never forget the day, you know, about... You know, a month and a half into this, man, Donovan comes to me, and he's totally stressing. He said, Pastor, I know I made the right decision, but I am struggling with this. I, he said, you know why? He said, I used to make more in eight seconds than I make in an entire month at Walmart. They've had their ups and downs, ins and outs, but today, Donovan, Donovan and Crystal Dez saved two kids, Jonathan Heinberg's outreach director here at conference and aiming at preaching the gospel. Hallelujah. Because he believes what somebody said once, the will of God may cost you, but the will of God will always pay you back. All sacrifice is in reality just a form of bargaining. Paul said this light affliction, which is but for a moment, works a far more eternal, exceeding weight of glory. That means the exchange rate is out of this world. The optimist says if you reach for the stars, you may not reach one, but you won't come up with a handful of mud either. But you know, faith goes beyond that. Faith says, if God promises you the stars, take him at his word and stand your ground till you receive the stars. And Paul said, I has not seen, nor has your ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. I'd like every head bowed and every eye closed. Attitudes of increase.